we shall solve the Schrödinger equation for one of the most classic problem in quantum mechanics, that of a free electron. As illustrated here, one can imagine the electron as an extended plane waves, or a more localized wave packet. In this video, we will learn how to construct these solutions to the Schrödinger equation, and discuss about their rather subtle quantum mechanical properties. For example, the particle velocities and the distinction between phase and group velocities, their probability representation and spreads in position and momentum space, and how the Gaussian packet allows one to realize the minimum uncertainty state. Let's begin. First, we recall the time-independent Schrödinger equation as given. The Hamiltonian H has two terms, namely the kinetic and potential energy. Written down in the position representation, we have the familiar time-independent Schrödinger equation highlighted in yellow. For a free particle, the potential V would be zero. This is a simple second-order differential equation, whose solution is the complex exponential, or the plane wave as shown, where K is also called the wave vector. Since this wave function is extended in position X, it is therefore not normalizable. Such a wave function is therefore not physical. Nevertheless, it is still a valid eigenfunction to our time-independent Schrödinger equation, from which we can construct our stationary states. If you are not familiar with the concept of stationary states, please refer to our video on time-independent Schrödinger equation and stationary states in this playlist. Each eigenfunction psi k to the time-independent Schrödinger equation has a corresponding eigenenergy, ek. We index each pair of these eigen solution with k. Starting from the left-hand side of the equation, we substitute the expression for the wave function. With some simple math, we arrive at a prefactor multiply with the wave function, where the prefactor is in fact our eigenenergy, given by h bar square times k square divided by 2m. With the eigen solutions for the time-independent Schrödinger equation, one can construct the stationary states for the time-dependent Schrödinger equation as shown. These stationary states psi k are basically plane waves, and there are infinite such stationary states indexed by k. Again, if you are not familiar with the concept of stationary states, please refer to our video on time-independent Schrödinger equation and stationary states in this playlist. We can compute the velocity of our stationary states. Since these are traveling plane waves, their velocities are given by the ratio of the coefficient of time t over the coefficient of position x and the complex exponentials. This velocity v is also called the phase velocity. However, we note that the phase velocity is not the same as the classical definition of velocity, vc, as given by the Newtonian definition of kinetic energy E equals to half mv square. In fact, the classical definition of velocity will yield us twice the velocity of our stationary states. We shall revisit this point later in the video. Although the stationary states psi k are solutions to the time-dependent Schrödinger equation, the general solution would usually requires a combination of these stationary states in order to satisfy the initial conditions, as shown in the pink box. Since the quantum number k which characterizes the stationary states is a continuous number, we write the general solution psi as an integral sum of the stationary states, weighted by the coefficient phi. Here, we pull out a factor 1 over square root of 2 pi so as to symmetrize the Fourier transform pair, which we will see later. Now, let's see how we can construct a general solution to the time-dependent Schrödinger equation with a given initial condition. Here, our initial condition is a Gaussian wave packet at t equals to 0. The Gaussian wave packet is centered at x equals to 0, and its localization width is described by the parameter sigma. Here, the standard deviation is given by square root of 2 multiplied by sigma. Area within a standard deviation constitutes 68.2% of the area under the Gaussian distribution curve. The modulus square of the Gaussian wave function would also yield a Gaussian function. The form of the Gaussian wave function is chosen such that its modulus square, or its probability density, is normalized, and has a standard deviation given by sigma. Okay, so we require our general solution psi to have a specific form at time t equals 0, as shown in the yellow box. At t equals 0, 
the time harmonics term in the integral dropped off. Thus, the only unknown in the integral that we need to determine is the function phi k. For cleaner notations, we shall denote the wave function psi at time 0 as psi bar. As shown in the yellow box, the functions psi bar and phi are related through a Fourier transformation. The Fourier transformation turns it from a function of k to a function of x. We see that the dimensionality of x is length, while that of k is inverse length. Thus, the Fourier transformation maps the function into its reciprocal space representation. The function phi of k can then be obtained via an inverse Fourier transformation as given in the green box. Since psi bar is just a Gaussian function, its Fourier transform is well known. We leave it as an exercise for you to show that phi k is also a Gaussian function as shown. Recall that the wave vector k is related to the particle momentum p as given by the de Broglie relation, p equals h bar times k. It is sometimes convenient to express our reciprocal wave functions as function of p. We show here the corresponding wave functions pair, psi bar as a function of x, and phi bar as a function of p. It is also easy to show that the norm of the wave functions psi bar and phi bar are conserved upon Fourier transformation, by making use of the identity for the delta Dirac function, as we had discussed in the foundation of quantum mechanics series. By the way, you can download the notes for these slides, see description of this video for the link. Now, let's return to our earlier question about the velocity of the Gaussian wave packet. Here, let's consider a general wave packet where the packet in reciprocal space, as given by phi k, is localized around the wave vector k0. We also introduce omega k, which is related to energy via the Planck relation. Let's define q to be the wave vector relative to k0. If the standard deviation sigma k is sufficiently smaller than k0, then, we can tailor expand omega k around k0 as shown. This allows us to write omega k as omega k0 plus omega prime k0 multiplied by q. With this, we arrive at an approximate expression for the wave function psi as shown in the yellow box. The approximations allow us to pull out a plane wave from the integral, defined by the wave vector k0. We call this the ripple term. The remaining integral term is called the envelope. Thus, unlike the simple case of a traveling plane wave, the velocity of a Gaussian wave packet is less obvious. The ripple term, which has the expression of a traveling plane wave, is traveling at a velocity given by omega k0 divided by k0. We call this the phase velocity. The envelope term, on the other hand, has a velocity given by omega prime k0. Since we know the expression of omega k, this allows us to obtain an explicit expression given by h bar k0 divide by m. We call this the group velocity, and we see that this also correspond to the classical velocity we discussed earlier, and is twice that of the phase velocity. The group velocity, which describe the overall velocity of the envelope, is a more physically meaningful description of the speed of the wave packet. As a final exercise, let us look at the position and momentum spread of our Gaussian wave packet. Let's consider the packet at t equals zero. The probability density, h of x, is given by the modulus square of the wave function, which is as shown. We can compute the mean of x square as follows. To solve this, you will need the identity of the gamma function in the yellow box. You should be able to show that the mean of x square is given by sigma square. The position spread, which is defined as the square root of the difference in the mean of square with square of mean, would then be sigma. Now, we have to repeat the same exercise for the momentum spread. The probability density, g of p, is given by the modulus square of the wave function, which is as shown. We have replaced sigma with sigma p, as defined in the yellow box, so that the momentum probability function looks symmetrical with that of the position probability function. Similarly, we also have to compute the mean of p square as follows. The math is the same as that of x we just did. 
you should be able to show that the mean of p square is given by sigma p square. Finally, the momentum spread, which is defined as the square root of the difference in the mean of square with square of mean, would then be sigma p. Heisenberg uncertainty principle states that the product of the spread of position and momentum should always be larger than h bar divided by 2. With the spreads we just derived, we can compute this number. Interestingly, we see that our Gaussian packet have the minimum uncertainty. However, note that these position and momentum spreads we just computed were for the Gaussian packet at time 0. What happens when our Gaussian packet evolve with time? Will it still satisfy the minimum uncertainty? We shall leave this as an exercise. Leave your comments below on what your answer might be. Stay tuned, and subscribe, so you will be notified of our future episodes. Join our Free Science Academy Discord channel to discuss science and technology. High school students are welcome to join and post your questions, we will answer them during our free time.